بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So um, getting to know Allah as um, just as it sounds um, a part of our faith and our the teachings of our faith is doctrinal in nature. There's a certain creed that every Muslim must um, adopt as their foundation. Who is Allah? Uh, what are some of his qualities? Um, what are some of his divine actions? Um, and some of the wisdom behind his legislation. And by developing this type of creed, a person of faith knows who it is to some extent that they are worshiping. And the more you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the more you are aware of him and his magnificence and his majesty, the stronger your devotion and worship will be. The less familiar, familiar you are with Allah, the weaker your faith will be and in turn, the more difficult you'll find it to um, embark upon a life of spirituality and religiosity. And so what I've done is I've selected uh, a very short treatise which was written some time ago. And the treatise is called Qala'adul Iqyan, which means the golden pendant. And um, it's an Arabic book, but I have um, taken uh, the um, honor, if you will, to begin the translation process of that book, which will hopefully be published uh, when we conclude together as a group. And so um, I hope to uh, go over the translation with you and highlight some of the points, explain some of the nuances of the text, and then get your feedback and review uh, through the process to make sure things are clear and understandable. And so tonight what I wanted to do is take a few minutes um, to discuss the author of the text. Um, the author of the text, his name is Shamsuddin, this was his title. Abu Abdullah was his kunya, uh, like I am Abu Ibrahim, the father of Ibrahim, his son was named Abdullah. His name was Muhammad ibn Badruddin, ibn Abdul Qadir ibn Muhammad ibn Balban al Ba'li. Uh, so al Ba'li is a location. He was also known as al Dimishqi for Damascus, where he lived, al Khazraji, which was the tribe of his family. As Salihi, which became um, also a place that he resided, and all that's in Syria today. And he was best known as Al Balbani. Uh, he was born in Damascus around 1006 of the Hijra calendar, and so this year it's 1440. This is the first day of the new year, so that was uh, 434 years ago that he was born in Damascus. So Al-Balbani uh, was from uh, the senior most students of one of the great scholars of the time, as shihab Ahmed ibn Abi al-Wafa al uh, in, in the subjects of hadith and fiqh. So um, like the scholars of the past, they came through a tradition of scholarship where they would sit with a master and they would be trained like very much the master and the student or the mentor with uh, his protege. And eventually, Al Balbani, he surpassed his teacher uh, in many respects, uh, but in particular, the mastery of the different schools of thought. As uh, many of you know, there are four major schools of Islamic law. There's the Hanafi school, which is um, the largest uh, in the Muslim world, and you can find that in. Um, Southeast Asia, you can find it in India, Pakistan, that region, Afghanistan, and it goes all the way into Turkey. And then you have um, the school of Imam Malik, uh, which today is prominently found in uh, North Africa, uh, or in Africa, I should say, North West Africa. And then you have the Shafi'i school of Islamic law, um, which can be found practiced um, in East Africa and in some areas of uh, the uh, Mediterranean, 
When I was visiting Tanzania, I found that, that Tanzania itself was a Shafi'i uh, dominated country. And then you have the school of Imam Ahmed, which are known as the Hanabila. Um, and that was the school of Al-Balbani and his uh, teachers. Because they were in Damascus, Damascus in that region uh, was a stronghold of the Hanabila of the time. So uh, Al-Balbani was taught by a shihab in the areas of Hadith, and he had many chains of narration. Some of them were very short, and he was also trained by a shihab in the madhab. But eventually, Al-Balbani mastered not only his own madhab, but became very, very well versed in the other madhahib, the other three, to the point that he was sought after uh, to teach those other schools. Um, and so uh, that was the case. Uh, Al-Balbani, he issued religious edicts, this was fatawa, uh, his entire life when he began or was appointed to do so. He was a leading scholar of As-Salihiyah. As-Salihiyah was a, a small town, if you will, that's located in Syria. Um, and that was actually during that era was one of the um, central locations for knowledge, for seeking knowledge and disseminating it. And in that little town or city, there was Al-Madrasa Al-Umariya, which was built by Abu Umar uh, Al-Maqdisi, who was a refugee during the time from um, Palestine. And they fled from Palestine seeking persecution or, or seeking asylum essentially from the persecution that was going on in the Holy Land. And when he arrived with a couple of his family members, um, they began to build the community. They joined, hand with, joined hands with the family members and also the locals and they began to construct not only a very large masjid during that era, but also Madras al Umariya, which was much like a university is today. And many students would come from far and wide to join, um, to join that, uh, that school, and many of them would come seeking Imam al-Balbani. Um, he had a very, very lofty status in the history of Islamic scholarship, Imam al-Balbani. Uh, he was loved by everyone, both his contemporaries uh, among the scholars and people of knowledge, and also from the lay congregation. You know, your average Joe Muslim knew of Imam al-Balbani, which means that he was a scholar of the people, he was very accessible, and he also must have been a very personable uh, religious leader. Uh, he was recognized by the leading scholars of the time as a master of Islamic sciences. One of those who was shortly after him, al-Muhibbi, he spoke at great length uh, about al-Balbani. And he said that he was a Hanbali jurist, a scholar of hadith. He was from the imams of asceticism or zuhud. He abstained from indulging in the worldly pleasures. He was a scholar, scrupulous, a worshiper, spent his time immersed in worship and knowledge, authoring, teaching, and learning to the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala secured his place in the hearts of both the scholar and layman. He went on, he said he was very religious, righteous, well-mannered, and he was a good companion. He was humble, he spoke sweet words, he was well-versed in both religious and worldly matters, and was traversing a path to Allah. He would frequently quote from al hafiz Abu Hassan Ali ibn Ahmad al-Zaydi. Uh, so al-Zaydi here is referring to Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein. So Ali ibn Hussein was known as uh, uh, Zayn al-Abidin was related to uh, Al-Hussein, meaning the son of Ali radiallahu anhu. Um, so Al-Balbani was actually from that lineage. And so he would quote from this great scholar Al-Hafid Abu al-Hasan frequently due to the fact that he was related to him, but also that he admired him. And one of the quotes that was most um, often cited by him uh, was make your voluntary worship as if it was obligatory. He says, make the nawafil like the fara'id. Okay? 
So basically, you know, the, the sunnah prayers that we offer, he is quoting an instruction that you treat them as if they're obligatory. Not that they are, but you treat them in such a way that they become sacred to you. So that you absolutely do not abandon the voluntary acts of worship. It says, treat your sins as if they were acts of disbelief. You take those misdeeds and missteps in faith as if they were paramount to leaving Islam. You take your desires to be like poison, mixing with the people to be like fire, and your nourishment to be like medicine. Meaning, the food that you eat, you look at it as medication. It's not something that you overindulge in, but something that you, that you simply use to uh, carry on. He said that he had a very particular way about him. Uh, as long as he was known, he would leave home in the morning time. He would go to Madras al Omariya, which was there in that region. He would go there in the morning. He would stay there. He would spend his time in prayer, reciting the Quran, writing, or teaching. There were people uh, during that time, they all agreed uh, uh, regarding his virtue and leadership. The scholars, uh, they have many kind and subtle words to say about him, according to Al Muhibbi. He was appointed as the khatib, right, the preacher at al uh, Jami' uh, al Mudhaffari, which was the main masjid there. That was the large masjid. And you can find, believe it or not, um, on, there's a video that was made for this masjid um, because it's kind of like a, a landmark even till today. And um, it has the design of the uh, Umayyad Masjid in Damascus. And so um, it's quite something to look at. And it was also known as uh, Jam al Hanabila. It became known as the Masjid of the Hanbalis of that era. And of course, many people would visit that Masjid deliberately to attend the prayers and also to seek the blessings found in there, meaning to attend the lessons and to be around the people of virtue and knowledge. It was said that he was what remained of the pious predecessors with the blessings of those who followed. Um, there was a book called Ar-Riyab al-Sundusiya fi talkhis tarikh al-Salihiya. So this was a book about the history of Salihiya, that region. It was written by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Kinan and he said that he met Muhammad ibn Badruddin al-Balbani and referred to him as Shaykh al-Islam. And so, as you may know, uh, this is an enormous title, um, a title that's only been reserved for a select few scholars, leading scholars throughout the history of Islam, and Imam al-Balbani was known among um, some of the contemporaries and especially those that were his students as Shaykh al-Islam. Uh, he was considered the great scholar of Sham, that region, um, and many of the scholars would go to Madrasa Umariya to read to him even though there were numerous scholars present in their own locality. So they would actually bypass the scholars that were living in their region to visit Imam al-Balbani in order to read to him uh, in order to learn from him. And so at some point it was noted that there was not a scholar in the region except that they had read to Imam al-Balbani and received from him various ijazat, or we should say, um, chains of narration for his hadith. Imam al-Ba'li, and this should be a familiar name because the book we were learning from Bidayat al-Abid was written by Imam al-Ba'li. He said that Imam uh, al-Balbani was the sheikh, he was the imam, he was an authority, he was the mainstay, a scholar, very special for his day and age. There were none like him. He was Shaykh al-Islam wal muslimi So he was recognized as a huge authority. He was the adornment of the scholars, the working scholars, the mainstay of the researchers, the pinnacle of rigorous scholarship. Muhammad ibn Badruddin ibn Abdul Qadir ibn Balban al-Khazraji al-Qadiri al-Hanbali who possessed many virtuous qualities and a very lofty status. Throughout his life as a scholar, he was also an author. Uh, he wrote numerous well-written 
and the scholars talk about the quality of his writings as being extremely well written um, and they're celebrated these books widely received by fellow writers and the scholars that um, dedicate themselves to explaining the works of others and from those works um, he wrote a book Kafi al Mubtadi Minatul Lab and this was a book of fiqh and um, our, our book that I was referring to, Bidayat al-Abid, the author of this book, Abdurrahman ibn Abdullah al-Ba'li, uh, that was the first book that he learned from. He learned from Ibn Balban or al-Balbani's book, Kafi al-Mubtadi. And then he wrote Akhsar al-Mukhtasarat, which is also known as uh, the supreme synopsis, if you will. It's been translated, a portion of it into English, called Hanbali Acts of Worship. Um, Akhsar al-Mukhtasarat, this was translated by Sheikh Musa Ferber. Um, and this basically covers the chapters on worship, prayer, zakat, fasting, and hajj. And um, Imam al-Ba'li, so here's that book in Arabic, Akhtasar al-Mukhtasarat, this is what it looks like. This is the size of it, along with some, you know, introductory works and stuff. It's rather small. Imam al-Ba'li came later and wrote this book. This is called Kashf al-Mukhaddarat. And this is the explanation of Al-Balbani, his book, Aqsa al-Mukhtasarat. So you can see Al-Ba'li has a connection to Balbani in that he learned from his works and then he served his master, if you will, by authoring an explanation to his book. And these books are considered um, authorities in their own right for their size and the scope of their, their material. He wrote other books called uh, Baghiyat al-Mustafid fi ilm al-Tajweed, so about the recitation of the Qur'an. Qala'ad al aqyan which is the golden pendant, that's the book that we'll be looking at. And this was a summary of Ibn Hamdan's book about Islamic doctrine. Uh, he wrote Al-Risala fi ajwibati as'ilat al-Zaydiyya, again referring to al-Zaydi. And he wrote Risalat fi qira'at asim which is about the modes of recitation. And Al-Adab al sharia about manners pertaining to the Islamic law. Uh, it was said that the number of works he authored and their summarized, uh, with, uh, in regards to their summarized nature, in comparison to other scholars of a similar status, paled in comparison to Balbani's knowledge. All right, so I just listed, I don't know, eight or nine books. So scholars of his status typically would have written much more. And the books they would have authored would have been, been much, much larger or uh, much more um, in-depth. So uh, Al-Balbani's books, though few in number and quite succinct in nature, um, it was noted that some of the biographers, when they would write Al-Balbani's biography, they wouldn't mention his books because the, uh, the, the level of authorship, if you will, or the amount of authorship just didn't match up with his status of schol uh, in scholarship. So it's kind of like it almost seemed to detract from his being Shaykh al-Islam in his level. However, it should be noted that um, to write um, a very, very short work, very concise work, can often be more difficult than writing something very, very large. And you, know, and you may know that when you have to sit down and, and, and type out an email. It's very easy to just be wordy and let it go on and on. But if you're trying to be very concise, it takes a lot of thought. I don't need this. Let's pull that out. That's too much. Get to the point. And so that's what um, Al-Balbani was known for. He passed away Wednesday night, the 9th of Rajab, the year 1083 Hijrah. His son, who was also a sheikh, Abdurrahman, led an enormous congregation in his funeral prayer in uh, Jam al-Hanabila, where he was the khatib, and he was buried at the foot of Mount Al-Qasiyun on the eastern side next to the garden, and the burial was attended by many, many people, and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower him with his mercy and that he shower us as well with his mercy uh, in this life and in the next.